human video that we saw yesterday. Oh my gosh. It was, huh? Oh, it was. It was so good. It was so faith building. There was a. Uh, I don't remember necessarily the song, but it was a. Um, it was just a victorious thing. It was so good that I think maybe Stacy and I might have been the only two who were fixing to get Pentecostal in the house. Like she was fixing to run, and I almost stood up on my feet and started shouting because it was so powerful because it was full of faith you know it was an awesome awesome time maybe maybe we'll find a copy of that one and uh, be able to show it sometime it was awesome listen you don't want to miss next Sunday we're going to be finishing get real um, we have had this series for nigh on two and a half months and uh, who knew that uh, what five Five messages could be turned into five and a half months or two and a half months. Um, I did not know that, but we're going to be finishing next week. We're going to finish on getting real about the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to talk. We're going to touch on the Holy Spirit today. We're going to talk about uh, some things that are important this morning. But you don't want to miss next week. I'm sure that you have noticed the things going on in the world today, um, you've noticed some things, especially stuff that's been going on uh, in Israel uh, right now. I, I, I'm sure, I think we've seen several videos that have been posted. Um, for those of you that don't necessarily know, uh, there is talk of the, the sacrifice of the red heifer, which has not happened um, since there was a temple in Israel, um, so we're t there, there is talk that uh, on the beginning of Passover, which is Saturday, Friday, Saturday before Easter, uh, that there will be a sacrifice of a red heifer. They got seven, and after combing through them, they're down to three, and they will pick one. Now, if you've been following us in uh, in the Bible reading, we've actually come across the passage that discusses the red heifer and the importance of the red heifer. Here's what this means, okay? According to the word, according to what God instructed regarding the red heifer, when they sacrifice the heifer, they are to take blood and they sprinkle it in front of the tent of meeting. Then they take the entire animal and they burn it in a clean place and they take its ashes and they store them. And then what they do with the ashes is they mix it with water and they will sprinkle people. Because the ashes of the red heifer signify cleansing, purity, and a reconnection of relationship with God. And so the importance of this is not just the end times prophecy that, that so many of us talk about. The importance of this is that there is a restoration of the worship of the God of the Old Testament. But there's about to be in Israel a recognition of who the Messiah truly is. So that we can see a fulfillment of they will weep when they look upon the one whom they have crucified returning. Okay. Now we don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we know that this is an important moment. The reason I put this out there is because what we're going to be talking about this morning, we're, we're talking about us, another aspect of community, and the aspect of community I want to talk about is commission. We need to understand that as much as community is about the church, and it really is, you heard that message a couple of weeks ago when we talk about the power of community, and thank you, uh, to, uh, uh, to Clinton for, for sharing his thoughts on community as well and, and giving a different angle and a different avenue and talking about some things to be careful of when you are in 
community. But as much as a community is internal, communities don't grow when they're focused internally. Communities only grow when they begin to focus externally. And so we're going to be talking about community and we're going to be talking about commission. In the 16th century, the royals of the time, to express their wealth and status, even to propagandize their influence, would search for the best and brightest artists in various available artistic mediums. They would find them and then challenge them to create masterful works of art that communicated what they wanted. And they would pay very handsomely by financing the project from beginning to end. The artist's sole responsibility was the vision of the person who had acquired their services. The responsibility of the royal was to supply whatever finances were necessary to fully meet the project's cost and give visionary direction throughout the process. They would call this a commission. The artist would receive payment at the end, but never would he have to use his own means to accomplish the project. I need you all to listen to this. The royal would take responsibility for full funding. And now in a similar fashion, Jesus commissioned us. And Jesus has supplied all that is necessary to complete the project. And our commitment is to follow through with the vision, relying on all the provisions that have been given to us. We do not rely on our own means to reach the goal. Now, I will say this. Yes, the things that we have talked about this morning about your giving opportunities, and uh, and we'll touch on that here in just a few minutes. But the truth is, is the monies that are in your checking account do not belong to you. God provided that. God provided the job for you. God provided the doors and the avenues for you to be able to make money. It is Scripture tells us that it is God who has enabled you to get and create and make, and make wealth in your life. So He has given you that ability through the doors that He opens. You don't have anything that you yourself made. So when we talk about finances and giving and all of those things within the context of commission, you need to know that if God came to you today and said, empty your bank account and give it to missions or give it to an evangelistic project or any of those things, know this, he has an absolute right to ask you because that doesn't belong to you. You're a steward of what is his. And so in that light, if he were to do that, my hope would be let's be obedient. But you also know this, that what God pulls and commissions, he returns. So just be aware of that as we move on in this. But we get the, we, we got to get to this place of understanding and commission is not just a go and I hope you make it work. The fact that Jesus gave us a great commission. Remember, this was all written out for us in readable language for all of us, dating back to about 1611, okay? And and this is where the King James came in and all of that stuff. But why was it given? So that we would have a readable version of Scripture because nobody knew Hebrew and Greek. Nobody could go to the original manuscripts and and write them out and read them out and do all of that stuff except for the scholarly individuals. So we had a Bible that was created for us dating back early 1600s. Okay? So the use of the word commission would have been contextually relevant to their understanding of commission... 
Oh, y'all are, I ain't getting no amens on this. So that you can understand that the reason they use the word commission is because the only word identifiable for them to have a context for would be how people were commissioned in the 1600s where they were sent, they would accomplish, but they never had to, had to pay for it. They were given everything that they needed to fulfill the vision of the one who had sent them. They never had to expend their own energies Except obey. Oh man. Okay, I'm excited. So I hope you guys will just get real with me. Because it is time that we get real about the Great Commission. You see, now let me say this to you before we, get, before we dig into points and all of that. Sheep swapping or leaving one church body to join another is not church growth. Lateral moves create happiness numerically, but they really are a break-even point. In fact, I would say that it's a zero-sum game to consider transfer growth. Because, see, to do that, it's like going into a field and digging up dirt to set right next to the hole. No new dirt was created. It's just old dirt that has been moved. But it's the same dirt. Okay, so evangelism, outreach and evangelism, the great commission as we understand it to be, is not about transfer growth. It's not about transplanting from one church into the next. Now, we welcome all, but understand that's not growth. You grow the church through the commission that we've been given. You don't grow it by getting disgruntled with one pastor and moving on to another pastor. You grow a church by people's lives being transformed through the evangelistic efforts of the commissioned arm of Jesus. Okay, all right. I know I'm preaching, so I I hope you're hearing me this morning. So firstly, understand evangelism begins and ends in the power of the gospel. Begins and ends in the power of the gospel. We're going to be going some places today, so enjoy the ride. Luke chapter 24, we're going to look at verse 27, and then we're going to skip down to verses 45 through 48. But let's start in 27. Reading in the, out of the ESV, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now let's go down to 45 through 48. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance, change the way you think, for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem, period, You are witnesses of these things. Luke records that evangelism begins and ends with the declaration of the gospel, which is Jesus' suffering and resurrection, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins is included in there. Now, Luke records, and so we've got to embrace the fact here that the gospel, evangelism, is telling people Jesus died. Jesus rose from the grave and it is to give you the option of understanding how forgiveness of sin is truly paid for. Now the reason they say this is because at that point in time the only means by which you could be forgiven would have been through animal sacrifice. So to repent for the forgiveness of sins is not to say I'm sorry I messed up. It's not to say, Lord, I I apologize for making these mistakes. It's to understand that you're in sin, and they all did, and to to change the way you think about how forgiveness happens. Because up until then, it was killing an animal, slinging some blood, burning some guts. The smell would be atrocious unless you're good at barbecue and know how to make it smell better. And so repentance changed the way you think about how to be forgiven. 
That's, what's the, that's the messages that are, that are going on in Acts. When Peter speaks to all of the crowd at, uh, in the temple and he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So they've got to change the way you think about how you're forgiven. You're not forgiven by what you do. You're forgiven by what he did. Okay, you're not forgiven by, you can't earn it. You can't do enough things in the kingdom to be forgiven. You can't volunteer for everything. We want you to, but you can't volunteer for everything and that merit forgiveness. It is only through the blood of Jesus shed upon the cross who died to save you. Who resurrected so that you can live forever. Because you will not be any better or greater than your master. Oh, come on now. So if he resurrected, you will resurrect. If he lives forever, you will live forever. You can't top that. So he expended and, exp and, and explained and expanded. And he represents the fullness of relationship with God. So that you can have fullness of relationship with God. Jesus declared the disciples as witnesses of these things. The word witness means one who has seen and heard. Or we would call him an eyewitness. However, it runs deeper than that. You see, the witness does not stop at, supplying, at just supplying proofs. The witness was originally a defender of what happened. He was responsible not only for saying what he had seen and heard, but more than that, to intervene in, in, in a lawsuit. It, it's the, the concept of witness is somebody who intervenes in a lawsuit. Accusations are coming. Oh, no, no, no. I am a witness to the truth. I'm standing in to get in between the accuser and the one being accused to tell you what the accused really has done was never to talk about what the accuser was doing. It was always about what the accused had done. And you are witnesses. In other words, you are defense mechanism. Mm. We'll keep going here. See, the witness was really a guarantor and stood surety. He stood as a surety there. Witnessing isn't just telling and retelling. Hear this. Witnessing isn't just telling and retelling. That's important. It is the proving it through your own life being changed in light of what you are witnessing. Amen. See, it's not telling people they need Jesus. It's revealing through your own life just how impacted you are by Jesus. How you're impacted by his death, his resurrection, and the power of changing the way you think about how to receive forgiveness. You see, so there's, everybody in the world is trying to earn a clean slate for themselves. They do it all the time. They fill themselves up with all of this negative and all of this bad, and they try to do something good because they want to feel worth. And so we approach them, and, and, and here's the thing. There is nothing wrong with talking and calling out sin. But let's be real. If people aren't connected to God and they're around you, they know it. You don't have to put your thumb on their particular sin. You don't have to call them a sinner. Anybody away from God is going to know when the holiness that comes from your lips is expressed in love and, and recognition. So you can't, you, we're not around here to go, ah! <laughs> this doesn't win people. This is for everything that from Wednesday night. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's my only shot, okay? <laughs> I'm paying for that one after, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> all right, all right. See, forgiveness is not found in the sacrifice of an animal. It's not found in a doing, but in the sacrifice of the Messiah as prophesied by Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, listen, if you want to know the gospel, read the Old Testament. Yes, that's right. Wait, what? Yeah, 
If you want to know how they applied the gospel, read the New Testament. But if you want to know what the gospel was, read the Old. Mm. <laughs> the word witness. Okay, so we've got to uh, uh, understand it's not just retelling. It's, it's proving. I am witnessing by my life, not just by my words. Listen, you can't tell people to go to church. When you don't, you can't tell people they need to be in church. When you hit your alarm button to snooze it about 12 times and then wake up at a 1045, well, I've missed. Maybe I'll catch it online. No one, you're not going to watch it online. You can't, you can't witness to anything that's not affecting you. Because the proof is always in you. If you're going to talk to me about Jesus, I better see Jesus. I better see what Jesus is doing. So don't just stand at a table and tell me about his love, but you can't love anybody. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You can't, you can't say, I love Jesus, but not love your community of faith that you're in. Do you, do you understand that? So the, the notion of witness is not just defending the gospel. It's I'm living proof the gospel works. So we embrace that. We embrace that. Second, without the Holy Spirit, evangelism is unsustainable. Without the Holy Spirit, evangelism is unsustainable. How do I know this? Because the commission involves the giving of the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe me, look at Acts. Luke records it in the end of Luke. He says, hey, you are witnesses of these things. Wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Acts, you come back and Jesus says it again. Go to Jerusalem. Wait until you're endued with power from on high. Well, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? It's not for anybody to know. But here's what's going to happen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be, what's the word? Witnesses. You'll be defenders and provers of the gospel. Verse 49, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my father, out of Luke 24, sorry, for verse 49, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Somebody say clothed. So the church's task will be difficult without the Lord's special ability. Understand. The Holy Ghost does not belong to you. Some people like to claim ownership, but he doesn't belong to you. Human strength alone will not accomplish this. God's intimate, indwelling presence is necessary to make it work. It is also significant that Jesus sends this promise. He is now the mediator of blessing from God. See, Jesus is... Is, is in the mix. He's not just sending you because he's the one baptizing you. He now is the guarantor of what you are to receive in order to accomplish. Okay? So, so Jesus does not leave you. He sends one just like him in his stead because he can't walk physically with us. So we have the Spirit of God as a representation of the one who died, rose again, seated at the right hand of the Father, makes intercession for us, and has now empowered us with his authority in the gospel through the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on now. Uh, So I I know I'm preachy-teachy right now, but just embrace this. Notice, it is the promise of the Father. It is not Jesus' promise. It is the Father's promise. We should immediately understand that if it is a promise of the Father, it's a guarantee. There will be no substitute for God's promises, which are yes and in Jesus, they are so be it. Secondly, Jesus uses the language clothing with power, which would resound in the minds of the disciples, especially since they are familiar with Moses, the prophets, and Samuel, as well as the histories of the kings of Israel. John calls it a baptism. Luke calls it an upon you clothing. There's this 
immersing, but in reality, yes, the water signifies this, and the immersing of the Spirit signifies this, this infiltrating, this dying of the self uh, to where the, when you come up out of the Holy Spirit, He sticks because He's in the fabric of who you are. But Luke calls it an upon you clothing. Understand, though, in, in the way that he's saying it, it's not like me putting on this jacket. Because if I put on this jacket, I can take off this jacket. Which, sure, and we see the church doing that often, don't we? We see the church putting on the jacket when it's necessary and then taking it off when we don't feel like it. But in reality, it's not clothing you putting on. It's the Spirit robing himself with you. He indwells. You don't indwell the Spirit. Think about it. You putting on and taking off is you indwelling the Spirit. Him putting you on like a coat is Him indwelling you. Because the jacket doesn't live on me. I live in. Come on now. So the Holy Spirit... It's not me living on the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit living within me. I know that's good. Come on, somebody. I should have... I'm glad I went to fine arts. It stirred me up. <laughs> this phrasing is important. See, the positioning of the promise is not an approximate location like Life 360. Many of you know what Life 360 is, which can accurately pinpoint to within 50 feet. No, it's an exact position. Interestingly, one commentary discusses this in terms of signifying a landmark. Signifying a landmark. The Spirit of God is upon you in such a way as to pinpoint, as to with pinpoint accuracy declare that you are a landmark that belongs to Him. And according to the Old Testament, you do not move another person's boundary land mark. So we've got to grab a hold of this. The Spirit of God puts us on as a garment. He indwells with in us, and, and know this, uh, that it's not, again, it's, it's not similar to a outer garment. It's like the tunic that the priest wore. It was closest to him. It's in the fiber of your being. It's on the very inside. And Jesus says, you can't sustain evangelistic commissioned efforts except I give you everything that you need. And the one that you need is going to be like a tunic. He's putting you on and he's going to dwell in the innermost being of who you are. And the expression of him will come out of you. What does that look like? Jesus says it. He says you're going to be witnesses. In Mark chapter 16 we read these signs shall follow them that believe. He says in my name this is going to happen. You'll speak with new tongues. That's similar to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's part of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You'll do this. But he also says you'll cast out demons. You'll heal the blind and the deaf and the lame. You, yeah, yeah you, you'll play. We don't play with snakes so we're not going to. But we, you know and, and, and I don't just go around looking for scorpions to step on. But those are also spiritual signifiers that the enemy of our soul will not have authority over us. That we may, we may see a serpent, but we're not afraid of the serpent. We may step on a scorpion that bites us, but we're not going to be affected by the scorpion because the greater one lives inside of me. He has forgiven me. He has cleansed me. He dwells within me. And he has sent the one to live through me. Here we are. We need. This is why we need uh, the Holy Spirit. You see, this is... This is a part of the journey of discipleship and the empowerment that we need. Why is this important? Well, for that answer, you actually have to go to Numbers chapter 11. I told you, if you want to understand what Jesus was saying, you got to go to the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 11, good place to be. The story is very simple. 
Moses is having some issues. This is, this is different from when his father-in-law says, hey, you need to appoint these judges. Moses is having some issues. This is closer to the end of Moses' leadership. Uh, but the scripture is very clear. God says, hey, I want you to do this. I need you to gather the elders, gather 70 of them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take from the spirit that is upon you and I'm going to put it upon them so that they can, along with you, carry the burden of Israel. Now we know that story, right? We, we remember it. 68 of the elders show up. There's two that decide not to come. And it doesn't matter where they were. The Spirit of God was taken off, of, was, was part off of Moses and put on those 68 who were in the room. And then those other two who were in their tents not showing up, they also were, in, were given the Spirit of God to rest upon them. And they were in the camp prophesying while everybody else was in the tent of meeting prophesying. Joshua hears about this and he goes to Moses and he says, Moses, uh, you asked for 70, 68 showed up. The other two delinquents are in the camp and the spirit went on them and they're prophesying in the camp. Do you want me to go stop it? And Moses says, are you jealous for me? In fact, this is what. This is what he says in verse 29 of Numbers 11. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on or in them. See, the point of the Spirit upon them was to aid Moses in carrying the burden of God's purpose. For the disciples and for us, it is the same. It is to carry the burden, the burden of Jesus' purpose given through the commission on the earth in reconnecting the world to God through Jesus' death and resurrection. In other words, Pentecost, which is coming up 50 days after Easter, is the New Testament fulfillment of Moses' prayer. It was the starting place... It is the continual when we have someone filled with the Spirit of God in, in our church, when there is that, yes, that evidence of speaking in tongues, or as we would call it also prophesying, when there is that evidence, you are just fulfilling the prayer of Moses. Would that God would fill all his people. His people. In other words, those who are Jew, those who are non-Jew grafted in, all of his people are entitled to the fullness of the Spirit of God through the prayer of the friend of God. Now hear that. Moses is the only one that ever God said, I speak to him face to face as a man. So Moses' prayer, yes, our prayers are, are powerful too, but Moses' prayer was fulfilled thousands of years. Because what does Peter say on the, day of Act, uh, on the day of Pentecost? This promise is to you and to your children and to your children's children and to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. He wasn't speaking just to the Jews. He was speaking about every person who would, next verse, daily such as should be saved, could become a partaker. So understand, yes, I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm spending some time on it, but we've got to understand that all of our efforts are unsustainable unless the Spirit of God is present in our lives, keeping us going. We'll, we're, we'll see people get saved, but it will be unsustainable if the Spirit of God is not in our lives. We'll see people come to Jesus through our evangelistic and outreach efforts. But it will be unsustainable. Because your money is great. And your body is great. But if the spirit is absent, we lose all momentum. All right then. I hope you enjoy that. And so lastly, outreach is part of evangelism. Outreach is not separate from. It's a part of. It's a part of. Outreach is the proof of internal change. It is the boots on the ground portion of a life that tells of Jesus' impact. 
It's, 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 again, it's that proving. I, I can tell you all about Jesus, but if he hasn't changed me, what do you care? The greatest way you can tell is by, he says, by loving one another. But then Jesus adds an additional component, not a law, an additional component to proving that your life has been changed. And that is through the term that we would call righteousness. See, outreach would be the biblical definition of righteousness. Sounds controversial, doesn't it? Yet Jesus says in Matthew 6, 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. He says, you've you got to understand that righteousness and the practice of righteousness in the first century, righteousness was not, I pray three times a day. I read my Bible every day. I'm reading a book. I'm going to church. That's not righteousness. Righteousness according to biblical instruction, first century church, as is evidenced through extra biblical writings in that 450 year period of intertestamental period. Righteousness is defined as almsgiving. It's defined as you obediently giving out of your pocket and giving of yourself. To meet needs of people around you. Righteousness is not determined by your level of spirituality. That's called spiritual. Righteous is a different thing. That's why Jesus says, beware the righteousness of the Pharisees. For what do they do? You tithe of your mint and your cumin. You do all of the religious part. But you forget the weightier elements of righteousness, which is justice, meeting needs of the people. If you don't believe me, read the Old Testament. I hope you are. Exodus is very clear. When you go through your harvest time, you don't glean to the edges of your orchard. You don't glean to the edges of your grape fields. You don't glean to the edges of your wheat and your barley. You don't glean to those edges. Why? So that the poor may come in and gather behind you. Don't do a second gleaning so that the poor will have something for themselves. Because the Bible says the poor you will have with you always. So righteousness was an expression of I'm going to make sure that I don't glean through my fields and clean them out. I'm going to make sure that what is left over is available. I know. See, the moment you start talking about tithe and offering and outreach as a matter of giving your body and your, and your finances, people don't want to amen you anymore. Because, see, righteousness of the Pharisee was about recognition. I'm going to parade myself. Pastor, I'm going to give $50 to this outreach. Thank you so much for that $50. We'll be sure to put you on an email uh, list so that we can tell you the progress of it. So that your name can be read if somebody's interested in knowing where the emails are being sent. There's your gift. There's your honor. Mm, see, I know. See, I was, it, it was great. We're shouting. We're Pentecostal almost. And now all of a sudden... Pfft, because it's hard, right? Reaching out to meet, to meet the needs of the needy speaks to your relationship with God. Believers do not show righteousness in piety, how you worship the Lord, or in the knowledge you have of God and his word. James tells it like this in his letter to the Jewish believers in chapter 2, verses four through 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food and one of you says to them spiritually because we love the Lord and we pray three times a day and we read our word and we have all the knowledge of God. Be blessed. Go in peace. Be warmed and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Righteousness is not, it is not without evidence in the Old Testament. We already alluded to Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. And it's funny. I want you to hear this. 
Because I, I, let me read it to you because so that you know it's from the word of God, not just me telling you a story. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of the vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor. Listen, and for the sojourner. Oh, here's where we get politically incorrect and we upset the apple cart. Because the, the, the sojourner is the foreigner and the guest who lives among you but is not a part of you. And don't say it's good if you don't agree with it. But you got to understand. Yes, politically speaking, there's all kinds of issues going on. But the church's role is to love the sojourner for the amount of time that they have with you. It's an opportunity for the kingdom. What would happen if the church, instead of picking up and wrapping the cross in the American flag, would do their due as righteousness, knowing we have a short time? Jesus is coming back very soon. We talked about that at the beginning. Do you think Jesus cares about the Constitution of the United States? No. Do you think he cares about the arguments that are going on in Congress? No. What does he care about? The lost. If we care more about our laws than his kingdom... We've, we've lost the plot, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'm, I, I understand. I, I believe, we, yes, as good, as good people, citizens and all of that, be engaged, be involved and in all of that. I would, never, I would never want to make you feel bad for not being engaged. But I'm going to say this. If salvation and eternity is not number one on your list and then everything else becomes second and third, then you have missed the gospel in your life. We drive around. And we get frustrated about stuff. But he says this, the poor and the sojourner, I am the Lord, your God. Nobody else. I am the Lord, your God. Consider this. Outreach is not simply meeting the needs of those around you. It is signifying that the old man who is selfishly indulgent, caring only for himself and his possessions, like the man who built bigger barns to hold his stuff that he had amassed, rather than giving it away because it made him feel good. It's signifying that the old man, that the rich young ruler in us all, has died so that the compassion of God towards his children who are either in relationship with him or are distant from him may may. may live and, and, and embrace and, and experience that compassion from God through me. See, we forget this, but we have an international community that goes to our college. The world has come to the doorstep of Mount Pleasant. And when we give toilet paper toothpaste, and those things. Many of those kids did not come with that stuff. And they don't have cars, and they don't have a way to get around. And so what do we do? We come in and we say, we love you. They've even asked us, why are you guys doing this? Because we love you. Now, the opportunity will arise. Well, why do you love me? Because the one who died for you loves you. And you are worth my time to put toilet paper in a bag so that you have something every time and it was it's this sounds gross and crude but every time you use this toilet paper i want you to be reminded Jesus loves you. Every time you brush your teeth, I want you to be reminded that the body of Christ has seen you and we value you and be blessed and be on every time you shave. Every time you wash your hair, we are communicating that the God in heaven who sent his son to die for you loves you. And so do we. 
because you are a sojourner among us. Pastor, that sounds like law. No, no. Don't misunderstand. Law, law has always been relegated not to the Ten Commandments, but to the Moses instructions on sacrifice. Read the New Testament, and Paul always draws the correlation between sacrifice and law. Never the Ten Commandments, and never the civil instructions on how to be a people of God. We may be free from the sacrifice, but we live out by faith through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The Ten in two. I know it got serious in here. But we need all, we need that part of us to die. See, we fulfill, and I'm, I'm closing with this, we fulfill the commission through giving and going. Yeah. It's easy to give. And, and, you know, it, it's easy to give. And we've all seen the commercials where with Jerry's kids and all those others feed the kids in Africa and do all of that stuff. And our, and our heartstrings are pulled on and we go, oh, $10 a month. And we give. And most of the time we put it on automatic so that we never even see it. Don't lie. So there is that giving and, the, and that, that financial component of it. Yeah, we need all of that. But there's also a giving of self in going. You see, we, it, it, giving that offering to further a project, giving that, that, that financial end to, uh, uh, in the local community, or sending out missionaries home and abroad. Listen, our missions pro program in the church is awesome. I'm so proud of the giving that we have for missions. That's wonderful. Keep it up. Keep it up. But that's only part of it. See, because the going is saying yes to the call of God and the sending out by Jesus. See, it's proclaiming the active testimony you have anywhere you can. It is not just giving someone the Romans road verses to lead them to Jesus. It's living out the Romans road in the testimony of your life. To, for people to see from trial to triumph over sin. From trial to triumph over the world. It is not our role to debate sin. Listen, Jesus gets in a boat. He gets in a boat and he says, hey, hey, uh, uh, you know, Peter's in the boat. He's been fishing all night, hasn't caught a stinking thing. Jesus goes, hey, let's go fish. Man, I've been fishing all night long. I've caught nothing. Let's go. Let, let, let's go fishing. All right. Peter kind of has heard of Jesus, but he doesn't know Jesus. We, we, I think we presume that he knew who Jesus was. This is just a crazy cat who has been, who's got this following. Could you imagine Jesus and this following coming behind him and he comes up to Peter and says, hey, let's get in the boat. Could you imagine all those people going, you going to do what he says? He tried to get out of it. We've been fishing all night, haven't caught anything. Let's give it another try. Okay, so he goes out. We've been fishing over here. Let's fish over here. And there's so many fish, he has to call his partners to row back out to get the rest of them. And the response of Peter is not, surely you are the son of God. He says, get away from me. I am a sinful man. The supernatural being relevant, being revealed in Jesus' life through walking the holiness, through living the righteousness, through the Spirit of God dwelling inside of him powerfully and loudly. One miracle of fishing. And Peter, I'm a sinful man. Get away from me. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm calling you out of that life. He could have done it any other way, but he chose by the Spirit to do it miraculously. We can't dismiss the miracle as the open door of salvation in a person's life. We don't get them cleaned, then get them saved, 
then get them immersed in the supernatural. We let the supernatural flow through us by any means possible so that when they're around me, they can have the Smith Wigglesworth effect of as he walks by, a person is convicted under the weight of the presence of God that is upon a man's life. I need you to hear this. It was more than just people wanting Peter's shadow to heal. There was a presence that was upon them because there was a dependence on a commission that had been fully paid for by the one who sent them. And they didn't have to concern themselves with the how because they were the how. They didn't have to concern themselves with the who because they were the who. They didn't have to concern themselves with the why because Jesus was the was the why didn't have to concern themselves with the where because they'd be led to go to the where they didn't have to be worried about anything other than the occasional tent that had to be made the occasional fish that had to be caught to sustain some life sure but the gospel that was the drive we're going to get real about it, especially in the season of the world that we're in. Listen, the media is trying to paint this as some cray cray thing, and they're, and they're going to come against it as best as they possibly can. And they're going to try and provoke all of us who are on this side watching it. They're going to try and provoke us into being stupid. The best thing you could do is go out and preach the gospel. The best thing you could do is engage in outreach and walk in righteousness. The best thing you could do is get out there and begin to fulfill the commission that God has placed in your life through Jesus and paid for. <laughs> Praise God for that. God's good. So stand with me this morning. Because we're getting real about the commission. We're getting real about outreach. We're getting real about evangelism. Tell people. Live it out loud. Live the changed life. Be free to express your freedom. Be free. Let it be what Jesus has always painted it to be. These who have turned the world upside down have come here. Father, we just praise you. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your word that brings conviction. I thank you for your word that challenges. I thank you for your word that brings transformation. And I pray for every person in this room right now, Lord, that we don't just get real with the parts that we want to hear, Lord God, but that we get real with all of your message today. Lord God, I pray that in each and every one of us, Father, we be confronted and transformed in that confrontation by your spirit. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord God. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. So I pray, Lord God, that there is an openness in every vessel to a fresh outpouring. That there is an openness in every vessel to a releasing of the Spirit of God that has already been placed inside of you. I, I pray, Lord God, that there is a, a mandate that cleanses our eyes to see, Father, through your eyes, Lord, the harvest, that, that, that our eyes will see through your eyes, Lord, the situations, that our eyes will see, Lord God, the, those who are around us that need the gospel, that have needs 
needing to be met, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that the, that the Spirit of God would empower our testimony, would empower our walk, and would empower our hands outstretched, reaching out into the community, Father, as we get real about every part of the commission that you have placed before us. I pray, Father, that we never resolve to depend upon ourselves to make it happen. But, Father, that we embrace fully, Lord God, your provision for the task at hand. Lord, because you've given us everything that we need for life and godliness. You've given us everything that we need for commission. And I pray, Father, that today, Lord God, that with every step, Father, let it be filled, let it be immersed, let it be soaked, Lord God, with love, let it be soaked with compassion, let it be soaked with conviction, let it be soaked with commission, let it be soaked, Father, with the very presence of God in each and every one of us, Father, so that we truly, truly, truly walk this out in this day, in this moment, Father, that we would rebel against the culture by bringing the spotlight back to you and Jesus and not on ourselves. Father, that we would take the focus off of us and put it back on you for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of eternity. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you're here this morning and, may, and any part of that message convicted you this morning, I, I want you to come find a place in the altar today and I want you to deal with that as you have been confronted